Terry, aka The Blue Abroad, is an AFL YouTuber with a channel specifically dedicated to the Carlton Football Club. Along with his co-creator Dan Williams, Terry produces weekly match previews and reviews, highlight videos, player interviews, a weekly live show and much, much more. Terry's story is an inspiring one, having pivoted away from a career as a lawyer to pursue his one true love, talking about the Carlton Footy Club. In True Footy Podcast 52, he and I discuss his decision to pursue his dream, his vision for the channel, and his passion for the old dark navy blues. Hope you enjoyed the episode. All right, g'day guys. Welcome to another edition of the True Footy Podcast. Today I'm joined by Terry from the Blue Abroad YouTube channel, the Carlton Tragic. How are you, Terry? I'm good, mate. That is the perfect introduction. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, mate. Um, so I'm led to believe that you are in isolation at the moment, just like myself. How are you finding that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, completely isolated. I mean, it's it's challenging. Um, it's a real shakeup of our existence, really. Um, you know, it's you know we have to change really quickly on how we do our everyday things. Um, but you know, you've you've got to adapt. So it's and we were just talking about it off off camera, how you, you know, as a content creator as well, this is, you know, it's an opportunity and you have a choice of how you're going to react to the situation. It it can be a bit doomsday and doom and gloom, or it's an opportunity to do some things that you probably haven't given yourself the time to do. So that's, that's my mentality at the moment. Yeah, that's good, mate. Awesome. Um, Before we crack into it as well, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell people who are listening who might not have heard of your channel before uh, what the Blue Abroad's all about? Yeah, so um, Blue Abroad started as just an audio podcast um, towards the end of 2017. So I moved overseas uh, back then and I had no friends. Uh, I was living in Israel and didn't know anyone, and I still loved Carlton. I've, I've been, a, like you said, a tragic since the day I can remember watching footy. And so it just started there, and, and um, you know, over time it evolved. Um, we'll get into it a little later, but you know, I worked with some, some sport clubs around the world and, and saw a little bit about how the fan engagement aspect comes. And I'm a you know, YouTube fan. I'm a big Arsenal fan as well, so Arsenal Fan TV is a, a big inspiration, and um, I saw that there's an opportunity. I always felt there was an opportunity for fan channels to take over, um, I guess, and, and add a level or a layer to the footy industry. And so that's basically what it is. It's all about Carlton. It's, you know, previews, reviews, reactions, and analysis um, coming from all angles. And, and it's just all things Carlton fan made, really. Awesome. Did you, you said you started as an audio only podcast. Was that something you did by yourself or did you collaborate with someone? Yeah, just on my own. So, um, I, used, I mean, I, I still do. I listen to a lot of Gary V. And back in 2017, he mentioned Anchor as a, the podcast platform. And that was the first I'd heard of it. And, you know, all of a sudden there was this ability to record something just on your phone, upload it to Anchor, who would then upload it and distribute it to all the podcast platforms. And that's really just how it began. And it was just a means for me to stay connected um, with other Carlton fans around the world. And so, yeah, it was, it's been just me um, up until recently. Well, I love that you mentioned Gary V. I've never mentioned this on the show before, but Gary V is actually a huge reason that uh, the True Footy YouTube channel took off. Um, he does get a bit of a bad rap by some people, but I just I do think his overarching message of um, there's no reason why you can't do it, etc., cetera, um, is brilliant. So I love that he was an inspiration for you. What point, because you said you were, you were living in Israel, so hence the Blue Abroad, at what point did it become more serious for you? Because, like you sort of alluded to it, you really want, you're quite ambitious with this. Um, at what point did you decide? All right, I'm going to transition this to YouTube, and then I'm going to really make a go of it. So, 2017 happened, and I was doing the audio, and you know we had a pretty good finish to the year. We had some up and coming guys. Doherty was all Australian, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was before he did his knee for the first time, and um, and then. I sort of started um, from the start of 2018. And then when it got serious was probably, so it was mid-2018. I was, I was in London. I was working on a, on a project. We were at Chelsea at the football club there with some of the other clubs doing some meetings. And um, I ventured off to Wales for an Arsenal game. It was my first ever Premier League game. And um, lo and behold, the Arsenal fan TV guys were there. I met Robbie. 
Um, he wow. put me on for a, for an interview, and I really just saw how simple it was. You know, small camera, little tripod, um, really, really simple setup. And I that was really the moment where I was like, yeah, I'm I'm doing this. Like I'm I'm gonna do this for sure. And that was probably sort of part one. And then part two was um, middle of last year. Um, I came home because I, I thought I said like, nah, like this is what I want to do. Like I want to give this a crack. So came home to Melbourne. My first game back was the the first game that David Teague took over. Um, and so a bit of an omen there, obviously, a, a, you know, a good win. And um, YouTube started at the end of 2019 and um, really took off from there. And then we added Dan to the channel. And uh, yeah, it's probably been about six months since it's been, you know, proper YouTube. Um, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't hit YouTube first. I hit Facebook first because I found a lot of the fans were there, um, a lot of Facebook groups and whatnot. And so I built a bit of a following there. And then I guess it was a little easier to transition them to, to YouTube. Yeah, nice one. I guess for some background for, for those listening as well, because you're quite different to the other guests I've had on so far in that you're a little bit older, a uh, little bit more life experience. So you're, I'm sort of closer to you in that sense. Guys like Caden and um, Young King Cooks and the pair, they're a little bit younger. So for them, it's kind of like, they haven't necessarily gone and done something first and then pivoted. So what what was your background basically? Um, uh, what, what did you do for work before this all started? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm just a typical kid from the northern suburbs of Melbourne, uh, real rough, rough upbringing in uh, the suburbs of Reservoir and Mill Park. So not a lot of kids um, end up going to uni and whatnot. None of my family really finished school. So um, when I got to year 11 and year 12, it was, you know, a, a big thing that I had the opportunity to go to uni. So I studied law, got into law, um, finished my degree, and then I practiced for three and a half years in Melbourne. Um, probably after year three is where I started to just, I don't know, I fell into this mode, this depression, because I was seeing the world changed and the internet happened and social media happened and Arsenal Fan TV was happening and I was noticing all of these people that were building lives based on what they truly loved. And for me, it's always been sport and Carlton more specifically. Um, and so, yeah, start of 2017, I left practicing law. I still remember to this day walking into my boss's office to, because I was going to China. I decided I was going to go and teach English for six months um, just to get out of the country. I hadn't really traveled much. And so went to China, taught English, and that just – I can't explain it. It just opened my mind to the world and, and what's out there. And, you know, there's so much more. We live in a bit of a bubble in Australia, particularly in Melbourne. And so, yeah, that kind of happened. And I always had visions of moving into the sport world. I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what role it was. Um, you know, my time in China, I, I ended up meeting some cool people um, just by chance and by luck. And, you know, if you travel, you really know that this happens a lot a lot of these magical moments happen. I ended up touching base with uh, the, the director of a company called uh, Just Sports Events, and they were in charge of running the AFL China game. And the director said, hey, we don't know anything about this game. We need someone to come here. And because and, obviously it was a Port Adelaide initiative. So we need someone to come there and just be with Port Adelaide, follow them around. And that was, I guess, my foot in the door to the sport world. Um, so I did that and I go back every year, obviously not this year, but I go back every year and, and, and run that game. And I guess after China happened, uh, my girlfriend at the time, you know, she got a job offer in, in Israel to, she's a journo. So I just had the mindset at that time. Yeah, man, I've just, I've just had six months where I've unlocked myself. Let's go to Israel. I've got no family there, no connection. I'm not Jewish, so I don't really understand the, anything. I don't have that connection to the land. Um, and that's where it happened. And then I, you know, I guess it was lucky that I did have a legal background because I ended up finding work for a tech company focusing on sports in Tel Aviv. And, um, you know, it took a massive cut just to like my life. I mean, you know, the wage I was earning in Melbourne was really good and, and secure. Um, and so I had to like cut that back. I was earning like 500 Australian dollars a week, but I was, it was in the world that I loved. I was in that industry and um, again, I was adding layers and, um, yeah, so I went from law to sports tech, but still with a little bit of a legal flavor. And then, um, yeah, I think I built the confidence and the know-how and I, the understanding of the world around me to sort of say, right, this is sort of what I want to do and this is how I want to do it. 
Wow, I love that story because um, I, it really resonates with me in particular. I, uh, I like you, um, I come from a legal background, so I finished my law degree like eight months ago. Um, and I, thank you. I didn't get quite as far as, uh, as practicing, but I think by the end of it, I, I can sort of relate to what you said about being a little bit uh, maybe depressed because I think when you, I found of, I sort of had a sense of like purpose, purposelessness in that I'd spent years, you know, pursuing something I didn't really have passion for. And while I don't want to close the door on that uh, totally, um, for me, I sort of discovered, you know, True Footy and YouTube sort of at the end of that period. And then, you know, as, as people know, I haven't pursued the law degree. I'm still here making YouTube videos. What would your advice be for someone who might be sort of in our age bracket or, or even, even older or younger who are maybe struggling with the idea that, you know, maybe they've, they've, they've wanted to pursue a job because they've spent a lot of time and money on it, um, like in the pursuit of it, or, you know, they just want to make a lot of money one day, but they don't really have a passion for it and are still trying to discover that. What, what would your advice be to someone like that? I mean, it's hard because when I first practiced, that was what I wanted to do. I mean, I grew up in that, in that notion, in that mentality of go to school, find the best paying job, something that's going to set you up. Um, I enjoyed law because I enjoyed legal studies as a subject and I've sort of decided, well, that's what I want to do with my life. Um, you know, and you know, when you say you're a lawyer, everyone sort of respects you a little bit more. They, they give you a little bit more attention. Oh, you know, you must be so smart. Um, I've, I've got, got that, that one. So much. Much. Yeah. And, and that didn't sit well with me because in a weird way, like I, I come from, I come from nothing. Um, and so to all of a sudden have people thinking of me like this, it didn't sit well with me. Um, and that was sort of one part of it. Um, the first two years, don't get me wrong. The first two years of practice, I would turn up to work. I'd have my office, you know, I'd, I'd done it. I would graduated. I'd got a job. I was living my dream. I was so happy every day and then it just changed. And so I guess my advice would be if you're younger, if you're at school, it's hard because you've got to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life at such a young age and you don't even know who you are. Um, I don't even know who I fully am yet. I'm still learning. But uh, I would say pursue what you're interested in for the time. Go go out. Go, you know, go full ball. And then just listen to yourself when you start noticing, like, there's an urge. Because like, there was an urge within me. After year three, I had a six-month block where I just hated life. I was going into the office and I would I would battle with myself. You know, on the one hand, it was like, stop being so ungrateful, you little shit. You know, you got a job you paid well, this is what you wanted to do, this is, these are just difficult times, you've got to endure. But then on the other end, it was like, yeah, but I'm not happy, like, I hate this. And so it took a while to listen um, to myself. And then, again, when the China door opened, like my best mate went there and he was teaching at the school that I ended up going to and he sort of said, you know, there's an opportunity here, there's, we need one more teacher, do you want to come? It's so easy, this and that. And this was one of many opportunities that had come and gone and I had said, oh, no, nah, I'll stick it out. Um, and so, yeah, and now for me, it's a lot easier to listen to myself. And if, if I change my mind, I change my mind. And so I would say, don't feel like what you are doing right now has to be forever. I think we grow up with the notion of, oh, you know, if you change your jobs every two years, you're not a good employee. I totally disagree. I'm all about adding layers to yourself and adding new skills because especially at a time like this, I mean, if you are pigeonholed into one thing. And that one thing's not available. You, you, you know, you're going to have to learn something else. So, yeah, I think you know we have a little bit. We have a lot of anxiety as a society. I think to find that thing and and you know know what you want to do. So I guess my advice is, it's all good. If you feel like you want to pursue something, go for it, and don't feel like you're pigeonholed and trapped. Yeah, nice one. I like that. I I can really relate to when you said you. It didn't sit comfortably when people are like, um, oh, law, you must be smart. I've copped that my whole life and it's it's not true. <laughs> like, it's so undeserved. I think I think what it is as well um, is that people who are, um, we've sort of got a legal background and can be articulate, which I think can sort of mask unintelligence sometimes. But um, yeah, anyway, um, I really also like the advice around being micro ambitious. That's a term I picked up from, um, I can't remember who it was, the name, but it doesn't matter. But um, I really like that term and it's something I've tried to adapt to my own life as well in terms of, um, like, I guess you can sort of always be a little bit, or, or it's easy to sort of fall into the trap of getting a little depressed if you if you don't have an overarching goal. Um, but 
I think if you can sort of be really dedicated in the pursuit of short-term goals, um, I think that's a really, really good way to be. But I mean, for you, right? So you're you're obviously a very good speaker, very charismatic. Um, does this sort of uh, does this sort of come naturally to you? Do you find because I think a lot of people as well can find it conf- uh, not confronting but um, nerve wracking, I guess, getting in front of a camera and putting themselves out there. How, how have you found that? So for me, I'm comfortable um, for a few reasons, and, and I've always I was always a kid that was curious and I would try things. And the one thing, like I love my mum to death, and the one thing she always pushed for me is to like don't be afraid to be different. And try things. And so when I was in year eight, I used to do like school productions and and whatnot. And and little did I know that that was setting me up for expression. And then, um, I mean, for me, YouTube and making videos is easy because, I mean, I used to appear a lot in court. And um, for those who are watching, you know, if you have appeared in court, I mean, I was 21 practicing, you know, going into court. And that is easily the hardest thing and the most nerve wracking thing I've ever done. And, you know, I guess from school production, you know, the expression and, you know, I used to do a lot of public speaking in high school and, you know, I was school captain. So I had to sort of do those things. And that in a sense taught me. And then once I got into the courtroom, um, you know, once I conquered that fear, YouTube and videos and expression, it's, it's okay for me. Um, I can understand totally people being fearful of um, what people are going to think and, I think especially in Australia, having seen other cultures and lived in other places where having a go at something is, is, especially in Israel, having a crack at something and making a startup and a business is encouraged. Whereas in Australia, um, we have a bit of tall poppy syndrome. And, you know, if you put yourself out there, you know, you've got to get chopped down. You can't be, you can't be up here too much. Someone's got to bring you back down to, back down to earth. So, yeah, I think that's where the confidence comes from. And I'm at a point now where, um, I've done things and I've experienced things and I don't think too much about what I'm going to say on video because I am confident in, in expressing myself. It, 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 used, it was a job of mine to be able to do that. So, yeah, I think that's where the benefit of, of that experience comes from. Yeah, for sure, man. I'd imagine like if you're actually appearing in court, the stakes of that the, your perception of the stakes anyway would be so much higher than, you know, making a mistake on a video camera on YouTube. Um, Dude, yeah. Yeah. Even, you, you can edit a video, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't edit a, a submission to a magistrate, you know? Yeah, that's so true. And I actually think, um, like as someone who's been to uni, obviously I haven't been in a courtroom environment, but, um, uh, like people will complain about why do we have a sign oh sorry why do we have like speeches every semester like why are we got to do this but by the end of my degree i must have done about 45 different presentations and you're right like the stakes of that it, i mean obviously it's not like a courtroom but obviously the stakes in a uni environment are still pretty you know nerve-wracking um and i think that probably prepares people really well for speaking as well and it's funny as well what you said about um how like your sort of childhood was sort of littered with sort of like um, examples of you expressing yourself. It's funny for me as well. I was a very outgoing um, sort of young teenager man as well. And I'd forgotten I was like this, but I used to just make silly videos and put them on the internet and then sort of forget about them. And then in my late teens, I went through a very self-conscious stage. I think there was a point in my life where I just, maybe it was around the time of girlfriends and stuff like that, where I was like, I gotta stop being a dickhead on camera. And I became very shy and I've been like that up until maybe True Footy started. And then now sort of when I talk to people as well and be like, you know, oh, like occasionally it'll come up but I'll just sort of let slip. I don't even like talking about it, but I'll let slip that I do a YouTube channel and they'll be like, oh yeah, I always knew you were going to do something like that. And I was like, how? I didn't even know I was going to do something like that. Um, so it's funny how life comes full circle like that. It's funny how what you do as a kid relates to what you're going to do as an adult. If you, if you really look at yourself and that was really what I did. I sort of said, well, what do I love? Like, you know, and before you, before I knew anything about the world and before I, you know, knew about work and money and anything, it's like, what was I loving? And so that, that's kind of, you know, as you grow, you try and understand yourself a bit more. You think about things a bit more. And, and it's so true. Uh, I look back at how I was back in the day and it's just so relatable to how I am now. Yeah, that's so true, man. Um, so, uh, before you mentioned Dan has joined the show, so you're kind of like a two-man act now. Uh, when exactly did that start? How did that become a thing? So, Dan was a fan of the channel. Um, 
on Facebook at the beginning, you know, one of the very early commenters, he would always comment on videos and I obviously didn't know him. I wasn't living in Australia. Um, and so what happened was, you know, we, you know, I, I talk to everyone, I, you know, obviously reply to all comments and anyone who messages me, I'm always up for a chat. Um, and so what happened was it was 2019. So it was last year, um, Carlton played Essendon but it was on the exact same time as the Port Adelaide St. Kilda game. So I, you know, I watch all the games live, obviously, and then do the reaction and review after. And I basically just said, Hey mate, and you know, do you want to, do you want to do a video, uh, a review after the game? And, you know, he was in, um, and Dan understands what I'm trying to build here. Like it's, yes, it's, it's my YouTube channel and, you know, guess I'm the founder and whatnot, but, um, and I took this from Israel and Israeli culture. What I'm trying to build is a platform here. And what I would love is to have multiple content creators who sort of use the platform for their own expression. And, and Dan understood that from the get-go. And so I just basically said, mate, would love to have you a part of it, um, you know, be a creator. And, you know, he's got a, a fascinating story of, you know, he's, he's, he's past, you know, how he came to Australia and how he became a Carlton fan. And so, you know, for him, it's all about learning more about the game. He's been in Australia for 10 years. He's a mad Carlton fan. And so I just basically said, mate, you've got a creative license. Here's the platform. Go and, you know, go and create. And so we've, you know, I've worked with him and, um, you know, he's, you know, it, it's good because for him, he's got something to focus on. And that's important for a lot of people um, to have an outlet. And uh, he's taken it with both hands. And I've sort of tried to integrate that and ask other people out there, especially those who post a lot on Facebook, like, do you want to have a crack at this? Like, this is what I've got. And maybe it's Australian culture. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but no one yet has really understood what I'm trying to get here. It's um, if you're, if you're familiar with the kibbutz in Israel, you know, it's a community that everyone sort of um, works off and builds off. And it's a platform. And, and a lot of the Israeli business models are based on that. Like the company I worked for, it was exactly that. There was no product. It was just a platform for sports tech startups to come and, and, and grow. So yeah, that's kind of how it all began with Dan. And then, you know, we've just taken off from there and, um, you know, he's become, no, he's not just a content creator. He's, he's become, he's become a friend, you know, a really good friend. And that's the main thing. And, and, you know, the relationships that we've built, you know, with, with other people have been, um, not something that I realized would happen. Like it's a serious community and I just, I'm grateful for it. That's awesome, man. I, I like it because I must admit when I first sort of started perusing your channel, obviously Dan's from the UK. I think he's from Yorkshire, right? He's got a really thick Yorkshire accent. You could be forgiven for assuming that he's the blue abroad at first. <laughs> yep. But it's funny funny how it's the other way around. But he's quite analytical, isn't he? I've, ha I've looked through quite a lot of your videos and he, he likes to break things down statistically and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool how he sort of adds that extra value to your channel. Yeah, so um, I mean... Dan's Dan's a, like a numbers genius, um, and I'm sure he, you'll get to speak to him and, and find out in, in due course. But you know he has an algorithm, TPI. He was a professional golfer back in the day, and um, he built the wow. algorithm for golfers. And you know it, it's <laughs> running in, in Europe right now. And what he's basically he's always been a numbers guy. And I always said to him, okay, well this is an element to the channel that I'd love to have, like we should have a, a portion of the channel where it's deep analysis into numbers and analytics and, um, and whatnot. And I, that's his division. You know, that's, that's what he controls. That's what he is good at. Um, you know, there's a lot more, there's, there's many more spaces that we don't have. We don't have written, we don't have other uh, angles, but he really comes from that analytical numbers background. And it, it's just a great layer to have. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I do. I like and respect the courage that you had to sort of open it up to someone else as well. Because I must admit, I there's well, there's certainly always a risk. Because you're someone who's very passionate and single-minded about getting this to where you want it to go, and I'm totally the same. Um, and to be honest, I don't think uh, I've really come across too many people who share that same passion. Even even with the boys. So when True Footy started, there was four of us um, who sort of. Um, at the time, we were all like sort of keen to give it a go, but it's before long, it became sort of evident that um, I wanted to push it a lot harder than the other boys, and that's no sort of criticism on them because, you know, they've got jobs and careers and degrees that they were pursuing. So, um, like, there's no resentment there, obviously, but I, that's cool um, that it's kind of paid off in the sense that Dan's just seems just about as dedicated as you are and you have the same vision. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is with Dan as well, like, 
the reality is eventually, and I, I, I want to help. I want to help him and him progressing and improving is going to help the channel, which is going to help me um, if we break it down. And, you know, there's going to come a time where, and I'll push this and I've told him this, like there's going to come a time where, like, Dan, go and start your own YouTube channel. You know, you, it's time, you know, and, and that's not something that I begrudge at all. That I would be happy and honoured for him to, to sort of, if that's the, the route that it goes down, he'll always have a place at Blue Abroad. But, I mean, he's got, you just got to sit and talk with him for an hour and he, you know, you'll just understand he's got so many layers and um, very intelligent guy and um, very passionate guy, as you can tell as well. And so, yeah, look, I, I don't, I don't worry about, and I, I know what you mean, like, and I've noticed it since I came back to the country, it's, we can be, it's, it, I don't know, again, if it's a culture thing here or, or whatnot, but we can be a little bit, um, this is my stick. You can't play with it kind of thing. Um, whereas I've always had the collaborative mindset and even when I've wanted to reach out to other Carlton pages and channels and whatnot, it, it's been pushed back a little bit. Um, you, you were great. I mean, you've, you've been really open and I, I mean, obviously I've only recently just started talking to you and you've been really open to the collaborating and, and that's been fantastic. But I, I must say it's, it's, it's rare here in Australia from what I've experienced since I got back. For sure, man. I think I think you're right in that it's like a cultural thing as well. I guess the way I see it is that there in this AFL scene, which is kind of like in its infancy, like there's enough room for all of us and more. Do you know what I mean? We're not competing with each other. We we're gonna feed off each other. And uh, on top of that, like I don't just do it for the sake of my channel. I, I, it's important to build friendships. So if, if you want to do this as a career, you want to have people in the industry or in this space that you that you like and stuff like that. So I just think it's it's a really good thing that you can collaborate um, with other people. And yeah, it's something that people should like really explore and it's something I want to do more of in the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. It's, um, it, I guess because I was away for so long, um, you know, I was in China for six months, Israel for two years, two totally different cultures to how we live. Um, Israel is pretty westernized, so it is a little bit similar. It took me a while to, to, to adjust to being back. I must say, I had to like re Australianize. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. I, I, I lived, um, I've spent like half my life overseas as well. I, uh, I went to high school in Abu Dhabi in the Middle East. No, and it's totally funny. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, that's, I don't think I've mentioned that too many times on the channel. But yeah, like, so coming back after high school and going to uni, that was a huge culture shock for me. Um, oh, it was really weird. Even just hanging out with Australians, um, I don't know if, for you, because for me, it was probably more of a delicate age between 14 and 19. Uh, coming back to actually like interact with Australians, I felt very, um, I guess, self-conscious and just like, yeah, I, I felt like I had to try very hard to, um, in a social setting and stuff like that. Um, did you find it like that at all? Um, it was a bit different for me because I had probably built up the confidence from being so away. True, yeah. And so yeah. coming back, I must say, I'm, I, and um, I don't think I've said this too often, but I mean, I'm, I just feel so different to everyone that I hang out with. I do. I, I, feel, I feel like my values are different. Um, I guess I've climatized now to the language that I've got to use and, and whatnot. But yeah, I, I mean, there, it, is, it can be isolating, but um, I love it. I, I like this whole self-isolation period is not something I'm scared of. I've been self-isolating for a while. Um, you know, Are you an I'm, introverted I'm, person? I am an extra... Um, can you be an introverted extrovert? Can you be that? So I've, so I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you put me in a social setting, I'm an extrovert. If, um, but having said that, like, I need my alone time. I need my own thoughts. Yeah. I, need, I need that. Um, but yeah, I guess it depends who I'm with. I'm, I've always been a, you know, palm out, shake a hand, meet someone. You know, I, I've always been, you know, confident in doing that. And I understand that that's, that's how you've got to get along. That's the, that's the power of networking, you know, whether it's a, a virtual handshake, a DM in an Instagram page, or if it's in person, go up and shake someone's hand. Um, you know, I've, I've been confident or, you know, able to do that. But having said that, I, I, I love alone time, you know. 
Yeah, I think you and I are similar in that sense. I described myself the other day in a podcast as uh, an introvert with good social skills. So Ooh. I love I love solitude, right? And it's something I don't think my girlfriend really gets because um, she's not the same. But for instance, I need my couple of hours a day to smash FIFA and listen to a podcast and just... That, that's almost like my meditation. Um, but if like, for instance, uh, I'll go to the uni example again, like when we're in a group environment. You know, when you when you get put in that table where everyone's got to sort of introduce each other and work together and nobody knows each other. Internally, I'll be like, oh, God, oh, God. And I'll be like screaming, like, I don't want to do this. And then as soon as we have to start, I'll be the one leading the discussion just because, like, it's just an instinct that kicks in. Um, yep. it, it, it's strange. Um, 100%. How, I wanted to ask you as well, because you've come back. Have you... Have you necessarily gone back to where you've you've lived before? I guess the what I'm angling at is I wanted to know how your friends and family perceive your YouTube stuff because um like are they super supportive or do they not really get it? Um, but also the, the other question to that is are you are you living in the same area you did before or are you more isolated from that? Um, so yeah, I'm living in the same area before. I'm back home with family, which was the timing was perfect because of what's happened now. Um, yeah. so yeah, long story short, left Israel, had my girlfriend there. We broke up, you know, it was a, it was a, it was an amicable breakup. Hey, I've got to go pursue my dream. You do your thing here. I've got to do my thing here. Um, came home back with the family. Um, they're supportive. Yeah. They're very supportive. I think and I'm very blessed to have parents who have the notion of just be happy. Um, I remember when I, I first broke out of law and I remember mum was just like, what about your career? What are you going to do? Um, and my grandparents, you know, old school Greeks, um, you know, they're always asking, are you still a solicitor? And I've recently made an account for my papu, which is grandfather in Greek. I've made an account for him on YouTube and I've, he's got a tablet. So I've shown him how to do it. And I've explained to him, Hey, this is, I'm doing this. This is what I'm going to do. I want to do this. And, um, I guess this is how you like my videos. Yeah. Watch the ads. Make sure you watch them all the way through. <laughs> um, but I guess, I guess I've, I think maybe because I, I did the whole law thing, practice and whatnot, I built, I feel like I built that, ah, he's okay. You know, we're proud of him and whatnot. And so. Negative mentality around us, you know, we don't do this. We don't deserve this. You know, kids like you, you don't go to uni. You don't go to, you don't become a lawyer. You don't get to travel. So I've always had this thing where even if, there were doubters and there probably are. Um, I, like, I love it. I feed off that. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, uh, call it petty. I don't know what it is. Call it ego. But I like proving people wrong um, almost more than proving myself right. Yeah, I like that. That's true. Um, that's a real, that sort of ties in with like a, a real um, Gar Gary V-ism where his, his idea that you shouldn't, like friends and family you love, but at the end of the day, like you shouldn't care what they think of you. And it sounds callous, but it's really important. And for me, the other thing he says is, um, if you're worried about what people are going to think when you say start a YouTube channel or anything, the best way to do it is have the conversation with the person that in your head is judging you. And for me, um, it, for me, I guess I was most concerned about my dad, not because, you know, my dad's a great guy. He's like one of my best friends. Um, Fantastic dude, so no criticism on there, but he's he's always been sort of like, um, you should make the smart decision, go to uni, uh, get the right degree, um, and, you know, put yourself in the position to make the most money. So he's very like, um, like very logical like that. So I was nervous about saying, you know, I'm going to pursue this YouTube thing because I didn't think he'd get that. But, you know, to be honest, he's he's been unbelievable throughout the whole time. Like, um, as soon as I explained it to him, he's just like, yeah, that's cool. All right, I can see what you're trying to do there. You're angling for a career in this you've done the you've done the thing where you've gotten your degree first um and that was like unbelievable for me because it was like i hear i was having this concern that maybe someone wouldn't really get what i'm saying but um just by having that conversation with him like uh flick the switch he was 100 percent supportive and then i kind of just like lost all doubt um about doing it i think you should also be you should also take solace in the fact that as far as I know, you know, the, the AFL or the footy, even the Australian YouTube sports scene, I always looked at you, Caden, obviously, um, you got you guys are the trailblazers in my eyes. I I'm not familiar with too many other footy fan channels. I know there's, there's the pair and there's a few others that I'm, I'm probably missing as well, but um, you guys are like the first, you know, and that's even more difficult when you're, 
when you're, you know, when there's no one else to sort of leverage off and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to do it like this person and this is what I'm going to try and do, that that can be even more isolating and difficult. So, um, you know, you should be, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, deep down you are and you probably don't want to be talking about yourself too much, but I'll do it for you. Um, <laughs> you should be really proud of the fact that you are one of the trailblazers. And um, I think it probably took me um, probably 12 months ago is when I sort of, became or had that ability to say yeah I love I love being different I love, I enjoy the fact that I'm doing something that not many people appreciate understand are on board with um, but I'm still going to do it because I believe it's going to work and I'm not going to stop until it does work I appreciate the kind words thank you um so yeah you're right like when I started uh there was pretty much no one doing the exact format that I wanted to do. So like you said, there was uh, there's Caden. I think I started before Young King Cookson. The pair was around. Um, but even their, their niches are so different. So like th- I'm not really competing with Caden for views. I'm not competing with the pair. I'm certainly not competing with you because you're, you know, you're Carlton focused. So people can watch us and they can watch True Footy. They can watch us. Um, sorry, you and can watch um, the pair as well. So I never really had that mindset. My mindset has always been, I've never ever felt like I would I was the best at doing this. That's never ever. In fact, I'm the harshest critic of my own content. I can't watch it personally. But my attitude was kind of like uh, again, I was kind of feeding off the Gary V content. But if you're the first person to work very very hard, you're going to put yourself in a good position so that one day when you're actually lifting the bar, you're already got that subscriber base. Um, and I feel like I've only started to lift the quality of the content lately. But because I've I've worked hard, I'm not the most talented person, but because I've just uh, had the dedication, uh, my mindset's always been like, the uh, the thing that stops people progressing their AFL channels, because there's lots of like short, smaller, medium ones, right? The, what always stops is the lack of motivation. They always just, they just lose that, you know, that drive at somewhere along the process. But if you just push through and break through, um, it can be very rewarding. 100%, man, 100%. I, like I've seen, like when I first sort of had the, you know, the mentality, right, this is what I'm going to do. It was going to be Carlton Fan TV. And I saw there was a channel called, there is a channel called Carlton Fan TV. Really? Um, yeah. So I found it there and I was like, damn. And then like I saw they weren't uploading any videos. They might've uploaded four, five or six. It was the fan format after games. And then years later, I ended up, it was fascinating how I figured it out. But years later, I realized it was a guy named Paul Sebastiani, who's a journo in Melbourne, amazing fella, really top-notch quality guy. He does a lot of the commentary for the VFL games for Carlton. Um, and I ended up finding out, oh, my God, that's Paul. And I've had a chat with him. I'm like, bro, that was it. You, you had it, you know? And I think, yeah, I don't know if it's a motivation thing. Um, I, again, everyone's got their own reasons for why they didn't pursue it or whatnot. But I see, I've see, i seen so many channels out there that don't haven't uploaded in two, three years. And you sort of think, if only you kept going. Yeah, so true, man. So true. I guess one question before we move on to maybe some Carlton stuff, because I do like to talk a bit of football on the True Footy podcast. On the True Footy but podcast. What, exactly. What, what, uh, what, what is, is your vision, vision for the, the end goal? goal? Where, Where do you, you want, want this to go? go? What, what does, does that, that look like? like? So, um, I mean, I strip it back. You know, if you said to me, if, I, if you said to me, Terry, I'll give you all the money in the world that you want, what would you do for the rest of your life? I would say I'd watch Carlton games and talk about Carlton games. That 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 is the sort of that's the the bare essentials of what I want to do with the rest of my life. That if if I if money wasn't an issue, right? So there's that. Um, the other thing as well, and you know, I've, I've all, I'm, I'm a very ambitious person. You know, I want to be on the board at Carlton one day. You know, 20 years into the future from now, whether it's at president level or just on the board. Um, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm like stupidly passionate about this club. It's like to my detriment, it'll be the best and worst thing to happen to me. But, you know, this for me is, is, is a platform that I want to eventually be like a fan engagement platform for the club. Um, that's the, that's the end goal. Like, Hey, you know, we understand who our fans are because the, the problem that I understood with a lot of the international clubs, they all have it. It's like Fenerbahce in Turkey. Great example. We ran an accelerator program with them and they came to us and said, Hey, We've got 41 million fans across all of our socials. We don't know anything about them. We just know that they they like and that's it. And so, you know, that's kind of the the little seeds that have been planted. And and that that is the end goal. Blue Abroad, you know, can I take it to the club? Can I have it as part of the club um, to have a better level of engagement with the fans? Um, And at a time like this, 
it makes you realise how important the fans are. And so I, I guess that's the end goal with Blue Abroad. I guess on a personal level, if it's sport media, great, no worries. But um, Caden mentioned this in his in his interview with you, he sort of said, you know, I've had offers with the AFL and whatnot. And then he sort of had that light bulb moment where he's like, no, nah, I think I'm just going to do it, do it myself. And so that's, that could be a possibility in the future. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're a very young, early, small channel. Um, and so big goals and ambitions, but you know, you just sort of got to take it week by week or year by year. Um, but I guess that's, that's the end goal. You know, I, I, I want to, you know, I will always be a Carlton person like, you know, as deep as I possibly can. And so to be at a point when I'm 48, 50, to say, right, I've built this. I want This is what I'm going to give to our club and, and be part of the club at, a, at an admin or off-field level and help the club, you know, move forward. That's that's always been something in the, in the bottom of my mind. Nice one, man. You're obviously a super passionate Carlton fan, probably to, you know, the nth degree. And I'm the same with the Eagles. Where yeah. does the Carlton love come from? What's the story behind you discovering the Carlton Footy Club? So my early life is littered with, um, you know, tragedy. And uh, it was it was tough growing up. My, my biological father left when I was very young. Um, you know, I used to see a lot of bad stuff happen, domestic violence and all of that. And so, you know, raised in a single mum household. Um, I was very fortunate to have a second chance at a dad. Mum remarried. And so... We ended up having a second chance, me and my sister at a, a, a you know, a big family. We have a, a younger brother now. Um, but Carlton was the first memory of elation and excitement. And in a time in my life, and I'm obviously commenting on this 20 something years later when I understand a little bit about what I was feeling back then, because a lot of those memories are still in the back of my mind. But um, at a time where everything was very, it, it, it was not a good environment to be in, what I was seeing. Um, Carlton, going to Carlton games, I remember going to my first game, it was at Optus Oval, we played St Kilda, and I just remember the roar and the excitement, and you know, as a, a five-year-old kid, that is just energy that you want to be a part of, and so that's where it all started, uh, i got goosebumps literally recollecting it right now, um, that's where it all started, the love has been there, um, and it just, it just, you know, it kept growing from there, and it was always the outlet the outlet for the shit times. And then when the times became better and we became a little bit more settled, you know, we moved houses, we had, you know, went to school, you know, all of that um, made new friends. It it just stuck with me. And, um, you know, if anyone who went to high school with me, like when Juddy came across, um, we might touch on that later, but when he came across, like if you come across me, like Carlton is always one of the words that you associate with me. I'm just, over the top, I just always bring them up. Like, it's bad, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. That's, that's who I am. <laughs> well, I don't think it's a bad thing if you can fuel it to, you know, make a cool career out of it. Uh, that's cool, man. Um, so you said, uh, how old are you? I'm 28. 28, cool. So um, by my maths, you probably were a little bit young for the 1995 premiership to remember, remember it anyway. anyway. I was, oh, yeah. not live. I mean, I remember watching tapes of it after it happened, but... It didn't really like the, the. It didn't really kick in like when I started remembering players and games and moments. Probably 2000 and when Murph was drafted, he was drafted in right. 205, and so basically yep. his career onwards. So 206 onwards, I was what 15. Um, that's where it all kicked in. I remember all the games. Nice one, nice one. So I do have to ask then. What is your high point as a Carlton fan? Because unfortunately, you've kind of adopted this highly successful club at a really rough time to go for him in a sense. What what would you say is your high point as a Blues fan then? Um, so obviously the, the finals, 2013, 2011, when we beat the Bombers, um, sorry, and then Richmond in 2013. But there was a moment, it was a Friday night, round three, 2012, we played Collingwood, we won our first two games by 10 goals. We smashed the pies by 60 points. And I'll never, ever forget the siren blowing on that Friday night, the MCG. I was sitting level one, row two, right where the 50-meter line meets the um, the boundary line. And I remember thinking, holy shit, we are going to win the flag. It's going to happen. And I, I'll never forget it. And then obviously, you know, Carazzo breaks his collarbone the next week because uh, Lonigan, uh, the drug cheat, you know, smashes him into the turf and then 
Murph, Murph runs into um, Dangerfield the next week and shatters his collarbone, and then that was it. But yeah, that 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 night, that Friday night, was was one of the like craziest feelings. It was like, oh yeah, I really believe we're going to win the flag. Yeah, so yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like that. I I kind of remember that Carlton side pretty well in around that 2011 to 13 range because that was when the Eagles sort of came up and made their resurgence from being a wooden spooner in 2010. In 2011, we shocked the world by uh, ma- making the top four, and then we, of course we had that classic semi final in Perth where we beat you guys by three points. That remains for me like one of the best finals I've actually seen. Um, I have to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have Gibbs or Cruz at that game. What is your recollection of that night? Like, did you think you got away with it? Did you think, we were, you know, do you remember that? Yeah, you're kind of testing my memory here because it was a while ago. However, um, I remember being very confident because... Like, throughout that season, you were pegged as, like, a real top four contender, um, at least in sort of the media, whereas the Eagles were pretty much sort of... It was more like, as they kept winning, people were like, oh, are they actually are they actually that good? Oh, they've just beaten a team. So, we, we beat you guys really uh, convincingly in Melbourne, and that was when I was, like, super confident. So, so going into the final, I was even more confident. I was like, we're in Perth. There's no chance we're going to lose this. My recollection of the game is that we... Where we were battling, like it was one of those games where, like, if we win this, it's going to be very, very lucky. So I couldn't tell you whether we stole one, but I do remember a massive sense of relief. I was absolutely overjoyed because we'd won the spoon the year before. Um, but I don't necessarily think I thought, yeah, we played better that game. But what about you? Were you felt like it was a real robbery? Man, you know, Cruiser has just, and I'm sure you'd be aware, he's just had this career that started so well littered with injuries ever since he did his first knee. And I remember that week we played, smashed them. Um, Juddy didn't even have his best game. It was all like the rest of the team. Gibbs hurt his shoulder at the end of that Essendon game. He didn't play against the Eagles that week. Um, Cruiser didn't play as well. And Cruiser's just been that guy that when he's in, we're better because he allows the other midfielders to have a little bit more space to, you know, do their thing. And uh, I remember there was a free kick that, could have been awarded to Andrew Walker at the end that wasn't as well. And, um, oh, man, a devastating loss. I really, really believe that we should have won that game. But history books will say that you guys were the better side and you were. Um, and, and in retrospect, that is as good as we've ever been since I've been alive, 95 and 99 with standing. Um, but that was really the year that got away because 2012, you know, goes on to show that, you know, we had the injuries and whatever else. So, I'm, I've been watching 2011 back again and just sort of realizing, oh my God, we had it. We had it. That was the year, but it wasn't to be. Yeah. I mean, we got we got paid out the next week. We got absolutely slaughtered by Geelong, who ended up winning the grand final by about six goals anyway. So um, I don't know how much you really missed out there. Maybe, I think Carlton, you did have a knack of beating Geelong back then. So maybe you would have had a good chance, but um, yeah. Um, I want to also ask you, and this kind of segues into the Judd conversation, because being an Eagles and Carlton fan, uh, fans, rather, um, that's a good topic. But how do you reflect on that period generally in terms of specifically 2011 to 2013? Do you feel like it was an underachievement or like how do you, or do you feel like it was bad luck through like those injuries you mentioned? How do you reflect on that? So, I mean, you know, there's the, there's the, the practical school of thought. Did you win a flag with Judd or did you not? And is that a success or failure? So obviously we didn't win a flag with him. You can call it a failure if you want. But um, for those who are non-Carlton supporters, you've got to remember what we had come back from, the salary cap infringements. That We still feel that today. Like, And so True. in twenty in 2005, 6, 7, we get uh, Murphy, Gibbs, Cruiser. 2011, Murphy becomes one of the best five or six midfielders in the league. He wins the MVP award, wins the Coaches Association award. We get so when Judd came, it was like we needed we needed something like that to just project us up because we've always had the the beauty of having the fan base and you know the emotional support from the people and the energy and the electricity. So um, if you want to talk about flags, yes, West Coast win because Josh Kennedy, you know, you want to flag with him, totally get it. But um, you need to understand also what it meant for the club who was coming back from where we were coming back from. We were stripped of the draft picks for two years and um, Judd brought the professionalism, which allowed Murphy to grow, which allowed Gibbs to eventually grow, um, which allowed guys like, you know, Dennis Armfield to play a role and Mitch Robinson to to play a role and, and, and you know, these kind of guys. And so, um, and man, oh, 
if I had a camera around me, like day to day, when Juddy was, was an, announced as as a Carlton player onwards, it was it was crazy. Like I remember going to school every morning at eight o'clock. So I was in year twelve in two thousand and eight. So that was the first season he played with us. I remember going to school at eight a.m. because mum had to go to work early. So I used to go to the library. I used to get the newspaper every day from the library. Cut out any photo of Chris Judd that was in the paper, which, as you can imagine, would have been most days. And I used to stick it on my locker. And I'm not kidding you when I say there's like 175 different cutouts of Judd in my locker. Like what he brought for the fan like me, the young fan, the the 16-year-old fan. And he allowed more fans of the club to develop, which allowed us to then follow that on with with Crips and, and whatnot. So, yeah, look, it, it was a loss practically because we didn't win a flag, but it was such a win for us off field. And, and you know, he could have gone to Melbourne and had that same impact. He could have gone to Collingwood and had a bigger impact. Um, Hawthorne, I think there was a, a possibility of that as well. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't take it back at all. It was a huge tick for us. Yeah, cool. I tend to agree with that. As an Eagles fan, I wasn't trying to sort of like poke the bear in terms of, oh, the Eagles won the trade. That wasn't so much where I was going. I do agree with you. I think it's probably, uh, for such a landmark case, it was like probably the most mutually beneficial trade I've seen in some time. So obviously the Eagles were vindicated. Yeah, the Eagles were sort of rewarded for, um, obviously we got two premiership players out of it. From a Carlton perspective, um, Losing Josh Kennedy must have been a bummer because you guys struggled for a key for, without a key, uh, key for, at least that's my recollection, in that 2011, 12, 13 era. I think from memory, that was kind of your missing piece. But I do agree with overall the, the value that he brought. I kind of thought maybe for Carlton, uh, and you, you, there's nothing you can do about this, but it almost came like a year or two early in terms of I felt like he kind of lifted the club up out of its rebuild uh, almost artificially. I don't know if you agree with that, but it was more like, oh, we've got Judd now, so we've pro- it's time to, to lift our game. But although I would say I'm almost more critical of the way things fell out at Carlton as an outsider post-Judd. And what, what's your recollection of that? Because obviously Ratton got sacked after one bad year, as far as I can remember. I think they finished 10th. And they said, no thanks, we're going to replace you with Malthouse. Some of the list management around that, like drafting Blaine Bokehurst at pick 19, um, that's that's a real head scratcher. So like, how, how do you view the fallout from that sort of post-Judd era? Well, I'll go from when he first came here. So we didn't really feel the effect of Kennedy leaving because Favola was the best, one of the best True. forwards in the game, right? So I don't even remember watching Josh Kennedy play, if I'm honest. I don't remember saying to myself, hey, we've got this young up-and-coming forward named Josh Kennedy. So it was okay. And we had Fev, and, you know, this was before Fev fell out with the club and had we we sacked him. So we didn't, you know, we had the the forward. We had him. And then end of, uh, we make finals in 09. We lose to Brisbane. He leaves, I think, end of 09. I think that's what it was. Um, And then we play finals in, in 10. We play, we lose to Sydney. And then obviously 11 happens. And yeah, we we felt the loss of him in in eleven. I was I was talking about this with someone last night. Like, had Favola still been there, and he would have been at his peak because he had just come off ninety nine goals in oh nine. I think it was. Oh wait, sorry. Um, yeah. You know, he would have seen, still been able to be a sixty five to seventy five a year goal kicker. It would have been a, a huge tick for us with Judd, and so we were hurt by that for sure. Um, massively hurt by that, and then. You know, with Rats and Malthouse, it was, um, you know, looking back, it's easy to say it was a poor decision. But I still remember at the time, 2012 happened, and it was stiff because we had, we've always been a club that you hurt our top end players, you hurt the whole club. You know, Murphy was like the best player in the team, one of the best players in the team. Carazzo was a very underrated player in the team. He was a, a tagger as well and, and, and took the best midfielder each week. So they missed a chunk of that season. Um, Rats was sacked because, you know, Collingwood had just come off this they had like a dynasty team waiting to happen. They fell out with Mick. He left. And so the criticism of Ratton at the time from all Carlton fans, whether they want to admit it or not, is he doesn't have a plan B. He can't, he, he gets outcoached every single week. And, you know, Malthouse is proven. He, he is what's going to take us to the next step because we've just played finals in 11, et cetera, et cetera. It obviously history will show that it was the wrong decision. And then we had terrible draft picks. I think our 20... 14 draft crop is just littered yeah. with with just 
rubbish, you know, like just... I think they were delisted after, after like, like a couple, couple of years, years, all of them. them. Oh, man. You know, the, the Matty Watsons, the Tom Tamays, the, the Bootsmas. Um, Viojo Rainbow. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, Dylan Viojo, <laughs> yes. And then obviously, you know, we get Mick, that comes in and then that happens. And then, you know, um, history might go on to say that Bolton was the wrong choice. But I think Bolton was the right choice for what we needed for these boys at the time because we needed, as a club, in my opinion, we needed a... We were Carlton, and I'd be interested to know if, what the perception is over there as well. We're an arrogant club, you know. We are Carlton. We'll do whatever, you know. It's always been we'll just pay our way through. We'll go get the best player. We'll get the best coach. This is the Carlton way. And so Bolton was the the changing of the guard and bringing Sauce back as a list manager and saying, right, we're not going to recruit players over the age of X anymore. We're going to go the draft, and we had never done that as a club. And I'm glad we did because. I remember 2013 and 14 and 15 looking at the list and saying, where the fuck is the future? Like Christian Jacks is not going to be the future, you know? Um, so in that sense, it's, we've, I feel like we're finally out of that cycle, but yeah, look, it was, it was, um, you know, when you, when you're trying to rebuild a club that's come from where we came from and you make more wrong decisions, it hurts. So yeah, that, that's sort of my take on it. I, a lot of people will say rats shouldn't have got sacked and maybe he shouldn't have, but a lot of the same people were criticizing him for not being able to have a plan B. Yeah, fair enough. That's that's a really good insight. So I guess fast forward to that Bolton era as well. Um, you said you were, you were a Bolton man. Would you go as far as to say as well that you thought he shouldn't be sacked or were you a bit aggrieved by that? And, and also, how would you explain why Teague came in and started winning games straight away? Because my personal belief is that it can't be that much of a gap between Teague and Bolton that there's, you know, an immediate effect. There's there's something under the surface there, maybe. But what was your sort of perception of all that? So I was wrapped with Bolton. I loved the I loved the message. I loved what he stood for. I loved what he said. I loved that he was teaching them life principles. And remember, that was a they're all babies. They're all drafted at, you know, year after he year. He seemed like a parent. Yep. 100%. He's got the teaching background. Um, you know, some of the things like Cripps mentioned a, a comment a few weeks ago about having equilibrium and never get too low. That's a Bolton principle. He used to say that all the time. And so, you know, it's funny. It wasn't until um, the St. Kilda game, which was the, the week before that China game last year. So we played the Saints at Marvel. And that was the week where I broke with Bolton. And I said, oh, my God, he's got to go. And so... Um, and then I, I, when I came back home, I went to a, a VFL function for, for the Northern Blues and David Teague was a special guest. And he, I sort of was, was sort of putting two and two together. But um, someone asked him in the crowd, what, same thing as you, what have you done that's so different? And he just basically said, you know, a lot of the boys were thinking about, you know, at a stoppage, where have I got to be as opposed to there's the footy and playing on instinct. And so Teague opened it up for them to play on instinct. You know, guys like Lockie O'Brien, who, you know, very young player, um, he played a lot of good footy under Teague because Teague at this uh, function said, I basically said to him, all I want you to focus on is running and kicking the ball. That's what you that's what you were drafted for. That's all I want you to focus on. So from that point of view, Teague has sort of opened him up. Now, don't get me wrong, the the question marks are still there. The season last year, we finished strongly. Yes, we did. Um, but the sting of the season was out. You know, we weren't making finals, so there was no pressure to make finals. Um, and so it still remains to be seen whether or not it's going to be a success. But the one thing I'm, I'm sort of looking at with Teague now is, you know, he's got that respect as a player um, and he, he seems to be a modern day coach in that the way he communicates um, with the players and the feed, like he, he understands that the, the modern day player reacts to feedback differently to the, the olden day player who you could just, you know, give him a bake and, you know, make him run and whatnot. That old draw sergeant type coach. So from that point of view, I'm, I'm buoyed by what I'm seeing from Teague, but you know, I'm also, I've got my guard up a little bit. Like I'll be ready a lot earlier than what I was with Bolton with Teague. You know, if it starts turning sour, I'll be ready because with Bolton, I was just rosy eyes. Nah, we're sticking to the process. We're sticking to the process. Look at Philadelphia in the NBA process. So yeah, that's that's where I'm sitting at the moment. I'm, I'm very I'm mindful, um, but yeah. Okay, what about in terms of yeah, a list perspective? You guys have recruited, um, you know, quite a lot of youth over the years, and 
I guess like my position has always been they still need a lot of time in terms of, you know, your weedering who's starting to show a bit now again um, after, I think he was down for a little while, wasn't he? But I think he's got massive potential and he's still, you know, how old is he? 21, 22. Um, these kids still need time. Your Stockers, your Lockie O'Brien, these uh, even, or well, maybe not SPS as such, but these guys need to develop. Where is the list at in terms of how far off do you think a finals sort of um, campaign is potentially? So I think, I think our best five players and we and I said this before we're a club that if you take one or more of our best five or six players out we can't do it you know we, we just we just can't do it because our bottom you know that old notion of your bottom six week to week if you extend yep. that to your bottom eight or your bottom ten those guys they're not consistent enough um you know to, I say it on my channel in the reviews like literally every week I can't we can't be seeing midfielders in the team who have less than 12 possessions it's just it's just not going to get it done so we're still not there um they do need time and i think they're being exposed a lot more because we're putting more games into them and we don't have as many veterans to sort of cover for them um i think we're still i i, I think one of samo fisher setterfield one of them needs to step up and become an a grader um i still think we need another bona fide star midfielder i still do think that um I think the forwards, uh, they're the ones that are going to take us forward. Harry and Charlie, they're obviously injured, so it hurts to not be able to see them. Um, I think we are another small forward away, although Jack Martin did show great signs. Um, but I, I think if it all goes right, and with Sam Doherty back, and he, he's so underrated to what we do and how we move the ball from, from defense to, to offense, um, I, I, I do think if we add one more layer in this and all, however it looks like, I think next year we can sort of push up to that, um, you know, 10, 11, 12 range. And then 2021, I mean, at some point we've got to stop the mentality of, ah, they're growing like we're Carlton. You know, we still have that mentality of enough's enough. You know, we, you know, it's time to perform. And I think, you know, Andrew Russell, our, our high performance coach said in a, the, the injury report this week, you know, players need three to five years in the system. So, the first year of this rebuild was 2015, the Jacob Wiedering, Harry Mackay, Charlie Kerno, et cetera. So they're in year five. Samo, Fisher in year four. Dow, O'Brien, they're in year three. So they need maybe one or two more years, and then that's it. No more excuses. We need it. Like, Papley would have been sick. You know, we do have a lot of boys play together, but um, the forward line is still, it's suspect. The three talls, they've only played eight games together. Like, it's its still the jury's out. Yeah, that's good. That's a very detailed and measured answer. I like it. I do want to ask you this question as well because this is something I think every fan of every club will probably have an answer for. But for someone who doesn't support Carlton, who, in your opinion, is like a secret talent at, at the Carlton who you think maybe the outside perception doesn't have them being as good as you think they will be? I don't know what the outside perception is of a, a Zach Fisher. Um, I think he's got the, the, the footwork in traffic, um, the dexterity. Uh, I think he's got a serious, you know, he's got some serious talent. And, and Jacob Wiedering, probably. I don't know how good people realize he is going to be. Like, he had a great first year. He had a bit of a second-year blues. And the third year, sort of a bit tough, got injured, whatnot. Uh, end of last year, started taking all the monsters, all the full forwards, all the big boys, all the, the mobile guys. And there was a change because Liam Jones got concussed and missed a lot of footy. Um, and then he, he smashed Tom Hawkins last round last year. We played him in Geelong, raining, lost by 10 goals. Tom Hawkins was goalless. He smashed Tom Lynch round one. I think Jacob Wiedering is going to be a, a... Like he's... I don't know if you want to compare him to Rance or whatnot, but he's that type of defender who's going to be the premier guy. I like it. I like that call because Wiedering is a guy I'm a fan of, as I alluded to before. Um, and he's, I think it's just a case of he's a number one draft pick and then as soon as he has a downturn, people go off him because he's in the limelight a little bit. So I felt like the outside perception of Wiedering is that he sort of fell away. But like you said, I think he's going to come back and come back hard because most key position defenders aren't playing consistent football in their first three to four years, in an ideal world anyway. But he's been exposed to like a lot of different opponents. Um, I want to ask you one more Carlton question. And this is a question I've asked the last couple of guests with their clubs. Coronavirus, right? So let's say this is a hypothetical world, right? 
17 I clubs love remain. World. <laughs> 17 clubs remain in the league, but Carlton go under. I don't know why Gold Coast doesn't, but Carlton do for whatever reason. What do you do? Because I know you're a Carlton man, and my impression is you probably love Carlton more than you love AFL generally. Would you lose interest in the sport? Would you pick up another team quite easily? And who would it be? Oh, man. Oh, my God. Um, it's a good question, right? It's a great <laughs> question. Under any circumstance, I don't see Carlton folding. But if I have to come into yeah, this right. hypothetical <laughs> world, if I have to come into this hypothetical world, um, I've got a soft spot for Port because obviously I've worked with them for a couple of years now. I go there and I've, I've met them all and work with the, the admin staff and the players as well. So Port are my, you know, my other team that I watch with, with real passion and one of my best mates, we're both from Melbourne and he somehow became a Port supporter. So I've been exposed to them, but yeah, I, I love Port Adelaide. Um, I would never support a club like I do Carlton. And if it means that we end up, getting folded and, you know, end up being, you know, in a local competition, I will become that local competition's biggest ambassador. Cool. I love it. That's a great answer. All right. Um, one last question, mate. It's been a great interview. Thank you for coming on. No, Why don't you t- no worries. Why don't you tell people um, where they can find you and what sort of content may be on the horizon for you in the future, um, particularly with this whole coronavirus thing? Uh, what can people expect to see from you? Yeah, I mean, look, we're on every single major platform, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Um, It's going to be a little bit creative now. We're going to be looking back at the previous games, reacting to previous seasons. It's a good chance to stop and reflect on the club that has been. Um, So I'm really going to dive deep into this rebuild. I'm really going to dive deep into the the salary cap issues and how we got to where we are. That's going to be the theme. Um, But there's going to be a bit bit of creativity, uh, quite a lot of reaction videos, I just did one uh, reacting to uh, soccer dives in world sport. Um, so it's going to be a lot of that um, and a lot of um, collaborating with other YouTubers because I think this is, this is the time to, to really rally around each other and feed off each other and, and help each other grow. And so there's going to be a lot of that. And, and again, the invitation is, is there. It's, it's there. It's a platform. And if anyone's interested in becoming a creator, let's do it. Yalla. Um, cool mate thank you so much for coming on again Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you Terry and uh, we'll have to do this again sometime anytime mate thank you so much for, uh, for having me on no worries at all mate cheers